Welcome everybody to what will be episode 223 on our CX-CC YouTube channel. Hey, don't forget to subscribe to CX-CC, especially if you're a fan of the Delta CX multiverse. We've got that new channel. And uh, first, of course, as always, I like to thank, oh, of course I'm broadcasting my husband sneezing. He's allergic to my broadcast. I don't get it. Thanks to all of our paid Patreon members and our free Patreon members as well, patreon.com slash CXCC. Um, please join. It's kind of like our mailing list and our extra fun stuff uh, with some cool perks there for the paid subscribers. Like you're going to get this video for two weeks before everybody else does. Um, but to me, it is my place without algorithms. And so I know that if I put something out there, the algorithm doesn't say no. So please, please join our Patreon even on the free version. All right. So today's episode is part of the My Job series, which we've been doing a bunch of. And now we are talking with Jeremy and Michelle about uh, their jobs, current and former, and maybe future, in the realm of design strategy and leadership. If you have questions, please put them in the chat room. If you're watching this later, put them in the YouTube comments and I'll get them answered for you. He, my husband does always sneeze at the beginning. It's so weird. Um, so let's start with having our super guests introduce themselves. Um, Jeremy, tell us about you. Hello. Oh yeah, well, it's great to be here. And also it's great to share uh, the stage with a fellow New Orleanian expat. Who dat, baby? Uh, we're gonna we're gonna throw out some New Orleans slang today. Talk about po boys and and who dat and and uh, yeah, you rights and all that stuff. So anyway, Michelle, it's great to share the stage with you. I love it. Uh, anyway, yeah. So I'm Jeremy. Like I said, uh, I'm from New Orleans. I live up in Cincinnati now. Um, I've been doing UX design for thirteen, I think thirteen ish years. Um, started out doing before that. I was gotten design doing advertising graphic design, web design, which got me into UX design eventually. Um, so I started out doing UX design and eventually moved up to leadership and strategy, doing service design for the last couple of years. So um, helping, uh, I was with GE Aerospace, no longer there, but helping uh, GE Aerospace to kind of think about their their CX, their overall customer experience and on the services side, um, you know, engines have to get service. So there's a whole thing there. <laughs> we could talk more about that. But uh, anyway, so that's what I've been doing for the last couple of years. Uh, up until I guess December this past year, so that's me. The abridged. Oh version. gosh, yes. Thank you for that, um, Michelle. Tell us all about you. Hi, um, I am also from New Orleans. Um, living in Houston for the past ten years now, and I have been in this digital industry for about twenty-five years now. So I like to say I'm an elder of the internet. It's a little uh, IT crowd uh, humor for you, uh, but. Um, I just kind of, you know, I went to school for graphic design and like psychology a thousand years ago and just kept learning stuff and rolling and rolling and rolling. And then here I am today. Uh, my day job is head of UX design at Chai One, which is a digital agency headquartered in Houston. And we work with large enterprise enterprises and industry companies doing really unsexy stuff, but it's the important stuff because it's the stuff that runs companies. Uh, so a lot of software that helps employees do what they need to do. Um, and I have a great team that I inherited and uh, I just, I love my team a lot. So I spend a lot of my time just helping them grow and become more awesome and uh, a lot of stuff in sales. I didn't think that sales would be a big, huge part of my life, but when you work at an agency, you will become a salesperson. It will become part of your existence. So that's what I do today. Super. And our My Job series has been both for people who hope to do jobs like yours, as well as our cross-functional teammates, leadership, and other peeps who you sometimes work with and they kind of don't know what you do and they're a little afraid to ask because they don't want to be like, hi, I don't know what you do. So I was hoping if I put a whole bunch of YouTube videos up with people talking about their jobs, all the people who don't understand will quietly learn. So then let's talk about, and we'll go through uh, each of you, um, what would a typical day or week be like in the world of a design strategist and leader? Jeremy? Yeah, so uh, mostly meetings, <laughs> a lot of meetings. <laughs> uh, but yeah, most of it is, most of it would be, um, or I'm, oh, am I back? Sorry. Um, yeah, so most of my, sorry, I was frozen. Oh, yeah, no problem. Uh, most of my, most of my days would be 
meetings, um, but they're meetings for a bunch of different reasons. So it's a lot of stakeholder management, <laughs> a lot of alignment, um, a lot of making sure that we're all on the same page. It's a lot of politicking. It's a lot of uh, um, helping teams understand that what they're building is not the only thing that matters. And especially in enterprise, when you have big orgs with big silos, uh, more often than not, you're spending a lot of your time trying to convince other people that you know they need to take other things into account that it's not just their own uh their own little priorities and stuff so um what i did too is a lot of strategy i think i had an interesting role because I, I like i said i was service designer but it was also kind of helping to lead the strategy so i know thomas talked about uh service design already so we don't need to dig too deep into that but there's a lot of the stuff that uh that debbie did um I'm sorry, a lot of stuff that Thomas did, but um, it was also, uh, you know, taking that information and then expanding on or helping like influence the rest of the team to get the to drive a roadmap. And in the case of GE, um, we had like kind of like a very high level North Star, but it was sort of, you know, one of those things where when you work at a big company, the leadership team, one person says one thing and everybody kind of jumps on it as if that's the, that's the thing we need to focus on. And it's sort of like trying to level set and say, look, like that's, yeah, that's like the priority, but we also have to do these other things and we have to do these other things first because, you know, this big thing is impossible to do tomorrow. How do we work our way backwards and actually get there? So, you know, working very closely with product managers to help define roadmaps, cross team dependencies. What is the value to the users? What is the value to the business? Because in enterprise, you need to worry about that just as much as you do the business, or sorry, just as much as you do the uh, the, the users. So, um, taking that into account and then helping our product managers to uh, you know define the roadmaps so we can ultimately execute on it at the end of the day. Um, and in our case, what we found was the vision was like very kind of um, tended to be, and I don't want to like, I don't know, not trying to like throw anybody under the bus or anything, but it, it tended to be very specific, not necessarily possible. So what we really tried to do is also expand on it a little bit, really influence the rest of the team, get the team excited about what we were building so that they wanted to also build this stuff. So I, I love this quote by Antoine de Saint-Exupéry about building a ship. If you want to build a ship, you don't just, you know, find the people, give them, give them tools, bark out orders. You, you find a bunch of people and you get them to long for the vast and endless sea. And I feel like part of our job as strategists was also to advocate for that vision so that people wanted to do it. So it wasn't just like beating them over the head constantly saying, you have to do this, you have to do this. Part of our job was evangelizing for that vision. So uh, through a lot of meetings, basically. <laughs> That's our job in a nutshell. That sounded good to that last bit. Um, <laughs> thank you for that. M Michelle, I guess probably thinking about your current job and maybe some of your previous jobs, what might a typical week or, or so be like for a design strategist and leader? So my role is probably a little bit different than Jeremy's was, you know, working at a small agency, I get the opportunity to kind of have a little bit higher impact only because we're small and I'm part of leadership of the company. So a lot of the strategic stuff that I'm doing is not project level, it's the stuff that helps run the company. So it's a very different uh, role than I've ever had anywhere else. Uh, my typical week, you know, the first hour of every day is basically sales support where we're trying to figure out what's what new projects might be coming, what new clients might we have. We're trying to figure out uh, how to do pitches where a lot of the meetings that I'm in are literally with our clients or you know possible clients trying to understand what their needs are and how we can help them. So we normally have a lot of these kind of first meetings where we're trying to understand what their needs are. And then we come up with a big old proposal deck. And a lot of times I take the lead building those because I'm the only person in leadership who apparently knows how to push pixels. So if you know how to push pixels, you get to do all the pushing of the pixels. Uh, so I do a lot of that kind of fun stuff. But I also have to do level of effort work for the work that my team would be doing. So I have to kind of figure out with the information we've got from them, what is what do we need to do for this project? So it's a lot of uh, using ESP, I think, sometimes to figure out what the future might be. Yeah, it, it kind of is. Uh, it, it, there's definitely an art to trying to figure out, based off this much evidence, how to build this and figure out what could possibly happen and you need. So. Uh, have to do a lot of that type of level of effort work to come up with uh, timelines and pricing and then doing the pitches themselves. So uh, a lot of my week is sales oriented. 
Um, I'm also involved in marketing stuff just because that's the need right now. You know, uh, if a marketing person leaves, the person who knows how to push the pixels and poke the hub spot, they get to do that stuff too. Uh, so I do a lot of that. Uh, I have one-on-ones with my employees, uh, which is, you know, I'm lucky in that half my team are leads. And the way that I feel about leads is if you're a lead, I am not babysitting you on a project. I expect you to own that. That is your domain. You are the king or queen of that thing. And if I've got to babysit you, we have a problem. So I'm very lucky that half my team are leads. Uh, so, you know, when I'm meeting with my employees, it's really trying to figure out, you know, do I need to punch anybody for you? Is someone messing with you? Is someone making your day problematic? You know, uh, what can I do to help you type of thing? You know, and, and it's really just trying to make sure that they have what they need uh, to grow and be successful in the projects. And, you know, a part of every one of the products we actually have, you know, there's governance time. And that's me, actually, you know, showing up some of the, you know, the sprint demos, that type of thing. I, I don't have the time to get in the weeds on specific projects and like, you know, I would love to be able to sit there and review every wireframe, every design in Figma and be like, you should do X, Y, Z. I don't have time. Uh, so usually I have to depend on my employees to tell me when they need help. We have a very active Slack channel. And if someone's having an issue with something, they'll post it to our design channel and we'll be like, do this instead, blah, blah, blah. That's very helpful. I actually love Slack. I love the ability for us to just sit there and like come together like what is it voltron which is a bunch of little robots makes a big robot we become a big design robot uh yeah not sponsored by voltron <laughs> uh let's see what else do i do we're not sponsored by slack well i'm gonna cut you off only yeah. because i feel like the show is half over and we've got all these questions coming into the chat oh, yeah. room and i want to get opinions from both of you on all these things which means we've got to go to the lightning version so when I ask you questions, you're going to have to try to give the shorter version of answers just so we can make it through, uh, you know, the, the next uh, 15 minutes together. So let's start with Melanie's question for each of you. What is your best tactic for breaking through and bringing together siloed departments or lines of business? Michelle, you want to start? Yeah, this is a, an important thing. I think the first line of business you need to care about is your developers. You need to be friends with them. They need to know you because you need to never just pass work over a wall. So become friends with your developers and become friends. If you happen to have like product owners or product managers, you need to become friends with them because in my opinion, they are the other side of the coin for what UX does. Uh, so those are the, the first groups that you really need to reach out to. If you get them on your side, that's gonna make all the difference in the world. Um, yeah, I'll stick with that. Yeah. I, I okay. Think, thanks for the lightning version. Sorry, Jeremy, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I, I, for, I think I totally agree there. I, for me, I, you know, I, this is something I say all the time. You can't build great software without great relationships and it's, it's across the board. So for me, like if you go back, I'll say, since we don't have a lot of time, go back and, and watch Thomas's episode with Debbie, cause he talked a lot about stakeholder management and, and stakeholder mapping. And it's really understanding what those people care about and then how how best to communicate with them to influence them. So it's about understanding what they care about and how you can communicate the things you need for them to help you with uh, in a way that will resonate with them. And I think the question was about aligning everybody, right? So it's, it's about having one-on-one -on -one conversations, understanding what each person needs and almost taking that back like you're doing user research and synthesizing that data imagine you're you know you're doing like affinity mapping and you're like what are all the things that these people said and what what is similar and what's not and then taking that back and i think dividing and conquering often works much better than trying to align people in a big meeting so if you've got people that don't agree take them out take them to the side get a sense for what um what what each of them wants and then go back to the larger team, see where you can find allies to also influence the people that you might not have direct influence over. In a large company like where I worked, there's no way me as a you know senior staff is gonna have any influence on an executive level thing. I need to find other executives that can influence that executive. And you'd be surprised how often you can find those allies if you just take them to the side and have those one-on-one -on -one conversations. So I think relationships, almost the key to, to anything here, one-on-ones is, is the secret sauce. Love it. Thank you. Um, yeah, claps for Melanie. Um, so uh, let's jump into Cherish's question, which is a cousin of the question I wrote down. I wrote down prove impact and ROI. And Cherish asks, 
how is your performance measured in your role? What kind of work do you have to do to demonstrate your value? Jeremy, you want to mm. start this time? Oh, man. Well, the thing that I focus mostly on, and this is something for me, because I was, I think I would consider an individual contributor at a staff level, a, a leader, a leadership role. So I'm going to go and call, I'm going to call myself a leader, even though I wasn't managing people. But um, for me, it's, it's working with your boss and your direct manager and managing up and being a really great follower to understand those priorities at the beginning of the year and understand what is expected of you. And it's almost like designing a design, writing a design brief for a project. Like if this thing will be a success when we hit these marks and at the end of the year, if you can figure out what those things are and you can say that you've done them, no one can say you weren't providing value back to the team. So I think it's, it's really hard, especially with strategy. Cause a lot of times it's five years out. It may be longer than that. It's really hard to tie a business value on, on a, on an idea. Um, but you can always try to figure out like those metrics, like, is it is, you know, and, and I think where we worked a lot of times the internal type enterprise stuff was really a cost center. So it's not going to drive value, but it could drive cost down. So you could say like how much, you know, um, how much decrease in, in labor or were we able to optimize some labor hours or increase efficiency somehow? So you could tie it back to there, but it's all about like understanding in the very beginning, like we're kicking off this project. What is it that we need to do? And then at the end of the year, you say, I did it or I didn't. You know, the metrics. I think the data is really important there. So that's my lightning answer. <laughs> Love it. Michelle. I'm evaluated differently. Uh, I have a revenue target. And uh, so I'm heavily uh, reviewed by how much sales I help to bring in, my impact on sales, and then my team themselves, they rate me. And luckily they like me a lot, but it's very revenue oriented. And then obviously the, the performance of my team, if they succeed on their projects, if the client is happy with the work that they have done, that shines on me. If they don't like the work that the opposite of shining on me, darkens me, whatever. Um, yeah. Lightning. <laughs> <laughs> very different roles. <laughs> Okay, I got the lightning. Uh, thank you for that. Um, if there are questions, please put them in the chat room. We're gonna go to Joel Barr's question. Always good to see him. He says, waves, oh, hello. Okay. Yeah, he says, hi everyone who I seem to already be connected with. Here's a question <laughs> I've been asking folks around our world. Imagine your craft in five years and then a decade. How would you describe what you're doing in your work, how you are performing mm. in your work, what is strategically important in your knowledge base and your ethos? Please check the chat room because that was a long question. You might need to see that one. You might need to see that one written down. Um, uh, okay, so let's try to sum it up. Imagine your craft in five years and then 10. How would you describe what you're doing and what is strategically important? Let's boil it down to that. Who wants to jump on that one first? Oh, gosh. You want to go, yeah. Michelle? <laughs> so is this in reference to how do we view UX or how do we view me, what I think I'm doing in five and 10 years? Joel? Yeah, I don't know. He's going to have to Did type it out. It? Or is he still, he's still here. Oh, he's unmuting. Joel, what's the story? <laughs> I mean, I, oh, I, just, I think it's just a fun question to kind of think about um but do you mean in general or do you mean me specifically no, no, i mean like in what you do right now you can only speak we can only speak for ourselves right we can only speak from where we sit so what i'm doing right now i mean i can't imagine in five years or ten years i'm doing exactly the same thing every job i've ever had has been a completely different like take all the skills you have throw them up in the air and catch them that's what you do at that job so my next job will probably be a different collection of whatever catch them in the air type of thing. Um, I'm hoping that I'm still in a position where I can have impact, whatever that means. Right now mm -hmm. it's a leadership role, but you know, even if you don't have an official leadership role, you can still lead and you can still have impact. So I just hope that no matter where I'm at, the people let me do what I know how to do. I know how to do a lot of stuff. The more you let me do, the better off you're going to be. That's kind of how I feel about it. Uh, so yeah, impact. Let me do what I want to do because I'm like Cartman. I do what I want. It's no nice. way. I'm totally uh, who I. Okay, people of my age who remembers the Saturday Night Live sketch, the Hurley Boy House Sitting Service. 
Let the boy water your plants. <laughs> oh, do you know that one? Oh, I don't everyone think I has to Chris go. Chris Farley, who's saying it? Yes, Chris okay. Farley there... and Adam Sandler. Please let it go, let water it your plants. That was, that was Peaks SNL for me. I don't remember that skit. To be uh, I think that was early 90s. Yeah, so, so you're like, let me do what I want to do. And I'm just hearing Chris <laughs> Farley in my head. So, yeah, I'll I'll type that one in the chat for people who want to look that one up. Jeremy, what's uh, Joel Barr wants to know what's in your yeah. crystal ball for the future. So for me, you know, so I, I personally, I think I'm very much in line with Michelle having impact, um, whether or not that's managing people. What I, I can tell you what I don't want to be doing is a bunch of HR stuff like dealing with raises and promotions and and, uh, you know, uh, all that, all the HR stuff and pips and all those things that you'd have to do as a manager. But for me, five years from now, I, I see, I, I still see the human element. I still see the research piece being huge. I think AI is probably going to take over as far as like helping conceptualize ideas for sure. But as far as like the, the human element, I don't think AI in at least in five years, maybe 10 is not going to be able to do any type of research to any real extent. It's going to be humans ha still having to provide the data to a, an AI to, to give some output. So I feel like there's still that piece that's still going to be huge is going to be the research and the ethnography, especially in enterprise, um, you know, observation, watching people do stuff. Like, I don't know how AI is ever going to really be able to do that um, until there's like Android, like data from Star Trek or something walking around doing research. But even then, what, 500 years from now, there's only one data. So, like, you know, what are the odds of that happening in 10 years? So, um, anyway, you know, data I don't know. I brother. think Data has a brother. He's yeah, evil. Well, that's true. He brother. was evil, but Sorry, yeah, yeah. I don't really trust him, though. Um, anyway, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I think, like, for me, um, I, I still see a lot of the same kind of things I do now. Um, I, I think AI is probably going to help synthesize the data maybe a little bit better. It's probably going to help pull data insights out of a bunch of data that's going to make it a lot harder um, or make, it's harder to do today. So um, if anything, it, it, it'll probably help me like craft better decks. It'll probably help me like word things in different ways that are more compelling. You know, I can, if we're about stakeholder management and the, the ways that that different stakeholders like to communicate, we could, I could see a thing where there's an opportunity to craft different messages for different stakeholders based on what we've said they like or don't like or how they want to communicate. You know, I like three, I like three bullet points or I like some other thing. I could see that being beneficial. So, um, I don't know. I don't have to answer your question, Joel, but that's that's kind of where I see it. Lightning round. <laughs> yeah, it's a fun uh, crystal ball uh, future lightning round. So I'm going to swing back a little bit to uh, my question. I tried to combine it with Cherish's. I'm not sure it worked. And it might end up being our last question, depending upon timing. But I'd like to know how each of you has had hopefully some success proving the value and importance of good UX work as part of a larger process. Um, any tips on on where you've been able to get that buy-in or or help people understand the value of what we do? Um, maybe, uh, Jeremy, start with you this time. Yeah, absolutely. So like I said, I work in a huge silo, GE, thousand person software org, on top of the product managers, on top of the stakeholders, right? Like that's just the engineers. Um, and so you've got a bunch of teams building a bunch of disparate things and none of them talk and the systems don't talk, the people don't talk. There's data literally has to be copied and pasted from one window to the next, even though the same team is at the highest level is all building the same stuff. Um, so we had a lot of really customer feedback, negative customer feedback that software's hard to use, go figure. Uh, it's not efficient, go figure. Uh, and they didn't, it didn't help them to do their job because as enterprise work, we're, we're, we're there to help someone else do their, their work in, in, their, in the aerospace industry. It's already most likely a pretty stressful job. The software doesn't make it any better. Um, and so we had a really hard time convincing stakeholders that they needed to talk, that they needed to take the extra time to build dependencies in or, or have systems in place where we could do global search or global notifications that are all connected to one central hub, right? Like that's a huge investment. And what we did was we had stakeholders and we were doing research and we said, why don't you come along with this? Why don't you sit in on these sessions and you can watch a user actually work? So we brought them along. We had them call into these calls and and in some cases actually go with us to the shop floor and watch things. And and I one or two different times, different occasions, the stakeholders were like, wow, we've made that really hard for them. Yes, we did. <laughs> for no other reason than you guys were trying to be fast. 
you wanted your work to be fast. So, you know, for me, the win is there. It's like, I didn't even have to do anything. All I had to do was like open it up and bring them along so they could see it firsthand because I could say that all day long, but it didn't make a difference. What mattered was them actually seeing a user having a hard time with the tools that they were responsible for. You know, uh, the tricky part though, is there's no metric to judge whether or not, you know, they do that in the future. So I think that's like one of our other challenges though, is like, they see that, but like, if that guy leaves and gets another job, the next person that comes in won't see that either. And they won't be held accountable. So how do we actually make that part of the overall process? So we, that was a small win. It wasn't a large win. We won that little battle, but we didn't win the war. So uh, anyway, I think that's something that we need to figure out is like, how do we get those metrics, those usability metrics, ease of use metrics, whatever metrics we want to use, put back in so that that person at, at the end of the year is, is held accountable and say like, at the end of your review, you did your job or you didn't. So anyway, that's just one example, but I hope that helps. All right, thanks. And uh, Michelle, uh, proving the value and ROI and importance of uh, UX as part of this delicious and complete breakfast. Yeah, so it just depends on who, you, who I'm saying it to. Before, I've, I've said it to uh, product managers where I basically broke it down using Legos uh, to sh show that you know if you like money, then you should like UX. And I broke it down into that because at the end of the day, I think um, I am not a big fan of fluff. I don't like talking about delight or people's feelings or any of that crap. I'm not wired that way. Um, I believe, and I say this all the time, that UX is good business. And if you want to make more money, if you want your company to be more profitable in the, today and in the future, then you need to care about your user experience. Um, and if you are proposing some kind of a, whatever, a project to a client, I'm very careful to look for proposals that are not like, let's do all this fluffy stuff to make people feel happier. They don't care. It, businesses don't care about how people feel. They care about if this matters, are people going to buy more or are they going to leave? Where's the money? Where's it going to drop off or where's it going to increase? If you can learn to talk like that, and I know that nobody wants to, you know, go to business school, get an MBA, you know, uh, I get it, but you don't have to do all that to be able to, to tie things like this back. And it's not dirty to tie back UX to the business because we are hired by businesses. They are the people who give us money. They're why we're employed. Uh, the, everything that exists in the world, even Facebook, it's a business, right? Facebook has a purpose. When you go to use it, they have strategic reasons why that thing exists. So you need to figure out for the company you're working for, what's that strategic reason for them to exist and how can you make that happen for them and give them more money? Yeah. Can I add one thing to that too? No more money. Too much. Can, no, can for... you add money to it? Yeah. So for the enterprise, like I mentioned before, it's a cost center, right? So like in that example that I use, it's not, oh my God, we made that person's job hard. It's we made that person's job hard and now they're more likely to make a mistake, which will cost us money, or they're more likely to take longer, or they're more likely to fat finger a thing, you know? So, so there's, um, there's that opportunity, even in enterprise to drive that, that business value beyond just that person's upset, you know? So um, anyway, I think that's just something worth calling out. I think M Michelle, you're dealing with a lot of commercial stuff where people are paying for services, but in, in enterprise, there's still that opportunity to drive business value, especially when it's a cost center. Um, you know, and so you could even, you could end up at the end of the day, fairly easily kind of like making calculations. Like if we spend X dollars and we make this thing X fat, like Y faster, and it takes, you know, Z amount of do do uh, dollars, whatever per hour, you can make that calculation. Like we'll actually save money. Yeah. So all of the work that my company does is for enterprises. We don't build commercial. Oh, okay. So, but you know, these large companies, they care about how much money you're saving them. You know, mm -hmm. we have our behavioral scientists go out and do a massive research thing and, and show like do task flow analysis and show, look at all this wasted time and energy and all these places where you have failure points. That means mm -hmm. money. So even if you're doing stuff for the enterprise, it's tons of opportunities to show the value of good user experience in, in those types of things. Cool. Well, awesome. Brilliant. This is great. We're almost out of time, unfortunately. So what we like to do at the end of these is to give each of you a chance to say anything final that's on your mind, but also please spell your name. Let everybody know where they can find you or follow you or buy something from you or things like that. So um, Michelle, we'll start with you. Spell your name and tell everybody where they can find you. 
Hello, my name is M-I-C-H-E-L-L-E, and my last name is P-A-K-R-O-N, and I am most likely going to be on LinkedIn. That's kind of where I chill. Um, oh, what else am I supposed to say? Oh, uh, is there uh, anything you're selling or anything else you're doing or... Oh, I mean, I do all kinds of stuff. I'm, I don't have any cool courses or anything to sell anybody. When I'm done doing this stuff, I go into a studio and I'm, I paint or I make ice cream and eat it all for lunch, that type mm. of stuff. No uh, I saw that on LinkedIn today. You ate ice cream I, for lunch. I ate a lot of ice cream for lunch. And then I was like like this in my meetings. I'm like, forgive me, but I'm crazy right now. Anyway, um, yeah, eat more ice cream. Uh, make it yourself. It tastes better. Um, and the only thing I want to tell people to do is think before you do. That's one of the things that doesn't get talked about enough in UX. People want to go into Figma. They want to push pixels. That is going to disappear, my friends. Five, 10, 20 years from now, people who just push pixels, you won't have a job. So don't do that to yourself. Learn how to think before you do. You're still riding the, that caffeine lunch. Okay. Thank you. Uh, awesome. Uh, <laughs> Jeremy, please spell your yeah. name and let everybody know all the things you're cooking up. I think you have a book coming out too. Ah, uh, yeah, I do. Yeah, Jeremy, J E R E M Y, no G. Sometimes people spell it with the G. Miller is pretty easy, M I L L E R. Uh, yeah, so I, uh, my big thing is I think relationships, 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 empathy for your team, not just your users. Understand where the rest of your team's coming from. Assume, assume empathy <laughs> empathy for your team though where you know I, I feel like that's not as buzzwordy as uh, empathy for users but um understanding where your team's coming from and making sure that you're working with them uh i think that's really important um anyway uh yeah you can find me on linkedin i post a bunch beyonduxdesign.com i've got a podcast you can check out episode 36 with debbie levitt she's on there uh and then michelle you're gonna be on soon too i think i can't remember when i'm recording hey. but uh I got everybody, everybody, everybody in the chat. Uh, <laughs> Megan, she was on once too. Hang, uh, hang was on. Uh, anyway, we got a whole crew. Um, yeah, that, and then I got a book, which is out now, beyondyoxdesign.com. Wow. Book. Um, so that's really exciting. And uh, yeah, it'll be a print version soon too. So I'm excited about that. Uh, see book now, audio book at some point. Um, but yeah, that's it, beyondyoxdesign.com. Awesome. Well, thank you. I just want to uh, wrap up by reminding everybody to please check out our future events, cxcc.to slash events. Um, subscribe to our YouTube channel where this will be in about two weeks. Don't forget the Patreon. We're having some good fun over there. And it's not on our calendar yet, but I have got some secret new uh, events that we're going to be adding. And one of them is Kayleen Lee and I are going to give you a bunch of different suggestions we have for different ways that we take notes notes during research sessions. Oh and God. we're even going to do some live note taking if I can rope her into it to show you some some good and bad techniques. So don't forget to watch our calendar of events. Uh, it also we've got a bot that posts uh, upcoming events to our Slack and our Discord. If you want to join Slack and Discord, check it out deltacx.com slash links. All right, I'm going to press the stop record button. But thanks, everybody, uh, especially I'm Lucia yeah, and me. those of us staying up late and all of you in North and South America that joined us live. Thank you again and see you all probably on LinkedIn when it's up and running. Right on. Thanks, Debbie. Appreciate you having Thanks. us on. Thanks. Bye.